free Scaro! Hello, everyone. Welcome to Radio Free Scarrow, episode number 906. I am Stephen Edmonton. Born in Vancouver. And Chris Edmonton. Um, uh, I hope uh, the, uh, big, big, big stuff. There's, there's a trailer to talk about uh, this this week on this uh, podcast. Um, there's Eurovision, apparently, to talk about, maybe. Uh, there's uh, so Gallif- Talk to Who episode episode titles. Episode one. Uh, yeah, titles. Part, uh, part of the trailer. Yeah, yeah, we'll be doing a a uh, second by the minute recap of the 36 second uh, trailer. We'll spend one minute on each uh, second. So we'll be here <laughs> for the next boy. half hour doing that. If only, um, if only uh, there's a Frankenstein <laughs> podcast that did this one. <laughs> <laughs> Frankenstein in a minute. Um, uh, all those going to Gallifrey One, uh, hope you had success on the Hotel Hunger Games on Friday, getting a hotel room. Yes. Because uh, mm-hmm. they get lapped up fairly quick. So uh, so best of luck to everyone. I don't know. I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't know what the status is. I know sometimes that uh, people cancel and like, you know, they have rooms like, you know, they open up a tab. Oh, I guess I don't need that one. They close it and it goes back in. But uh, I imagine that the block is pretty well and firmly uh, sold out. But you never know. There might be some. It tends to work itself out over the next however many months it is. It, yeah, it does. So, it's, so, you know, if you didn't get one, don't panic. Um, but uh, but there are many, many other great hotels uh, available in the area uh, for Gallifrey. One next February. Um, this, this sort of, uh, spells the, the end of the, the spring preparation for, for Galley and then they'll sort of take the summer off. So like we, I, I still love that, you know, um, we, we go through this without ha- having a single clue, uh, about any guess. uh, but we're also excited cause we know it's going to be great. So, and it will be, it will be. Yep. Every year. Every year. It's going to be great. So. Yeah, might uh, the, I mean, last year we went. We usually, Chris, you go there, basically for a whole week, Tuesday to Tuesday. Um, yeah, usually. Yeah, I'm. Which I'm all, all started all started off because it, I forget what year it was, but mm-hmm. it was cheaper to fly out on the Tuesday and pay like an extra night's hotel and whatever from food and such than it mm-hmm. was to fly out on the Wednesday. So right. Then uh, ever since then, it's been, yeah. Then I can. <laughs> <laughs> also have some time to do stuff in Los Angeles. Yeah, not that's just, not yeah. just Galley. I know. Yeah, this this past year was like really busy for me for work leading up to it, and like that Thursday, I didn't do anything by choice because I just like I just need a day off of not doing something. So, so I'm uh, the opposite. Yeah, I uh, I did Disney Monday Tuesday, and, uh, and then we hung out Wednesday and then Thursday. So I just opted for Wednesday this time. I'm like, ah, I've already done the big California trip last year. What it will, it will be last year. So yeah, ah, I could just hang out and do diddly squat on the Thursday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see what it comes. Let's see what happens. You know, sometimes it's fun to go to an LA Kings game or something like that or an Anaheim yeah, Ducks game. Once, yeah. yeah. So. Although I have difficulties wanting to go now that it's uh, the crypto.com arena. <laughs> we'll see how long that Gross. lasts. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Uh, I do love it when sports arenas, giant, you know, institutional buildings become f- flighty business names. Yeah. I know. Uh, I know there well, was like that. In, it's yeah. like in basketball where they have things like the preparation H right. arena. And what, what. Yeah. Five minutes in to the basketball reference. Good, good. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> basketball. basketball was, was a movie from the 1990s, folks. Put together that even the men who made really it, the South Park guys, hated making. So Chris oh, is the only did. fan of this as far no, as I can you're, tell. You're right. They absolutely did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I never watched it. Um, so anyway, oh, Gallifrey sure. 1. Uh, Gallifrey 1 is coming. And uh, I imagine tickets are still available, even if hotel rooms are not. Yep. So go to gallifrey1.com, buy some tickets. It's going to be a fun one, the 34th one, Miracle on 34th Street uh, tie-in. Next year at Gallifrey 1. Um, so, Doctor Who, uh, Eurovision happened. Uh, the BBC yeah. has been has been uh, yeah. pump, pumping the tires of, of something coming, Doctor Who-related, uh, uh, to tie in with Eurovision. 
Um, and it ultimately <laughs> paid off, I'm, thankfully, just before Eurovision. So those who don't watch Eurovision yeah. didn't have to watch Eurovision to watch the Doctor well, Who Number content. one, as I said last week, it would never have been during. No. Anyway. Uh, That's and true. Number two, it's not a tie-in with Eurovision. It just happens to have come out yeah. on the same day as the Eurovision final. Mm -hmm. If it ran during Eurovision, it would be a precipitous dip in camp levels. So we can't have that. Well, there's... So Catherine... So um, there's always a representative who reads out the jury votes, points <laughs> the, the, for, retur the returning officer, if you will, Catherine Taylor. Sure, whatever. <laughs> no, there's, there's a representative that reads out like jury votes right. um, for every country that's involved. And, and for the UK, Catherine Tate was at the arena reading out the UK votes. And uh, at one point she, well, at one point in her, her spiel, she did say L on Z. That's and a Doctor then, uh, Who reference. It's a Doctor Who it. reference, yeah. and then um, thanks to like Google alerts and things like that, last night after the fact, I saw mm -hmm. a bajillion things out there. Uh, Catherine Tate uh, says secret Doctor Who phrase. <laughs> in Every single <laughs> click merchant was beside themselves oh, yeah. with joy. Oh, uh, this is trivial nonsense. I can yeah, exploit. They were, they were they were clickbaiting themselves all over the place. Oh, gross, man. But Sweden won. So, Sweden won, you know, apparently. Seventh time, the, I think, that Sweden's won. Is that... Uh, seventh, seventh time, so they're now the tied for the most wins, and also the uh, Lorraine, the person who won, was her second time winning, which ties a, another record from Ireland, where only one other person has won twice. Like, Technically we, a third time, because he wrote a song that won, but he didn't perform it. Oh, yeah, well... Was, uh, go ahead, Warren. Sorry, go ahead, Steve. No, no, I was going to say, I was please. informed... Uh, yesterday that apparently even though it's not supposed to be political and the whole idea behind your vision is to bring europe together and make everybody friendly to one well, another utterly, utterly political. most of it is is kind of a stick in the eye to putin this year so. yeah well it didn't, some of it was which yeah. good russia good. like launched an invasion of the ukrainian city that uh, contributed the uh the song like it at the exact moment that they were performing the yeah, song yeah great thanks you know? yeah. thanks there russia so, yeah. well well done way to win the hearts and minds there russia you're doing great everyone loves you <laughs> Well, there's a the the entry from Croatia, for example, was uh, very anti-Putin. So. Good, mm -hmm. carry on. Yeah. So take that as as as, a, as apolitical as as Eurovision is made out to be. Uh -huh. A, it, it's not. No, it's, it's rather political, especially with voting blocks and all that. But also the um because Eurovision, the like the EBU, the organization that runs it, because they. They barred Russia from entering, who traditionally would enter. Mm -hmm. But once they invaded Ukraine last year, they're like, nope, you're out. Yeah. So because because they opened the door with like anti-Russia sentiment, it's kind of hard for them to tell any competing country, oh, you can't have an anti-Russia song because, uh, you know, all they're doing is following what's already been done. Mm-hmm. Even though, also, years, even though years ago, years ago, they um, some countries were barred from having like Putin, Putin um, centric songs, even anti Putin songs. Right. So it's very political, not simply to amuse, is what uh, is what we're saying. But uh, <laughs> in these days. Well, amuse it does. So yeah. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you and I don't know 18 pe million people who watched it on BBC One. I don't know what the I, this. We're not doing stats. No more stats. Uh, but uh, thank I don't know, God, didn't do well. I don't know. I have no I idea. I have no idea how many people watched it on BBC One, but no, I, d I did not. It weirdly it doesn't. Uh, I mean, not uh, you. Of course, found a way to watch it, Chris. But uh, like I think Peacock well, in the they US put it on YouTube. It's a live stream. So oh, is not, it live? Okay, on, it's not difficult. Oh, okay, I for some reason I, I wasn't sure where it would go because I know Peacock in the U.S. Uh, airs it on yeah. their platform, but there isn't uh, such a thing in Canada. Surprise, no. surprise. Well, there was. Um, oh crap! Who ran it? Somebody Pro broadcast it in Canada a few years back. Some fringe cable, like Bravo channel. or something, wasn't it? Maybe or, uh, uh, I don't think it was Bravo. TV. Oh, TV. <laughs> yeah, that would be. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, they do love camp. And it is pretty campy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I didn't watch it because, you know, it's not my thing. But um, if it's your thing, I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed the Doctor Who content, like the trailer and the episode titles. We now have titles, folks, of the three David Tennant specials coming in November. They are as follows. The special one is called 
the Star Beast. Uh, second one is Wild Blue, Blue Yonder, and the third one is the Giggle. Now the and the, they also had a teaser trailer. And now the interesting thing about this is that uh, Russell T Davies said like a couple months ago in Doctor Who magazine that um, they haven't shown any footage at all of the second one uh, in any of the teasers that you've seen. And true to form, in this one, they show, like, the trailer says they have a bunch of clips, and then there's a special one, the Star Beast. And then when they cut to, like, what would be a clip of the second one, all that crazy redacted stuff, which has sort of been uh, tying in with the little teasers, the little binary code teasers that they've dropped on Twitter and stuff over the, the past few weeks, that pops up. So they're still willingly avoiding showing anything from that second special called Wild Blue Yonder, which is interesting to me. What are they Wonder hiding? If, yeah. This is my this is my cooked up theory I just came up with. Okay. And maybe that's where we get Shooty and then we skip Shooty for like one episode and then we go straight back into Shooty. Uh, uh, no, I doubt it, but that's no. just an idea. No. But no. you're gonna be upset when they don't follow through. No, I through don't care with one way either, because I, I just came up with this. Now so. well that's it. Now that you've created it and that if they don't do it, you'll be very upset. You'll be very uh, angry. sure if yeah. you be bad if you insist. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I don't I don't um I don't look at uh, the set reports very much, but uh, but one that I did see uh, I can I can now confirm is is that the the tiny bit in the trailer with Neil Patrick Harris as mis insert mysterious character name here uh, is dancing with David Tennant. Uh, that was actually. Uh, a bit that I saw on one of the set report things, which is kind of intriguing. It's like, oh wow, I know where the camera, I know where the the fan watching that was. He was probably down there on, on the screen right there or something, which is interesting. So, yeah, so um, interesting stuff. You know what? It, it looks it it looks very cinematic and different than the previous David Tennant <laughs> era of Doctor well, Who, yeah. which is you know yeah. obviously was going to be the case, but it's still exciting to see. You know, it's very cinematic. Well, almost, so. almost fifteen years have passed, and right cameras and lenses have gotten a lot better in that time frame. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of arbitrary theories, uh, uh, somebody was insisting, I don't remember who, some fan, was insisting Matt Smith is somehow in this. So now people are just taking any blurred photo of an extra and saying, that's Matt Smith. No, that's Matt Smith. No, that over there is Matt Smith. Got to be Matt Smith. Right. Yeah. Not necessarily the case. Oh, well, yeah. That's the joke. Yes. Yeah, I know. Anyway, uh, it's always exciting. Um, hopefully this, uh, and this, this, you know, this, it was interesting that they were building up to this because it was just like, here are the, the episode titles. And uh, I wonder if Wild Beyond is like a, I don't know, a anagram or something probably isn't. Who but, knows? Uh, but well, it's, uh, it's, uh, Susan. There's, it's an there's, there's Susan. The, the phrase Wild Blue Yonder from like the US Air Force theme. Right. So I was just looking through the lyrics for that and mm -hmm. nothing jumped out as like, if there's like a cryptic reference to that. Right. All I know is that when I heard the giggle, I immediately thought of Colin Baker as a six doctor going, the giggle, <laughs> the giggle, <laughs> just, just utterly contemptuous. Uh, I don't, who knows how it's going to work out. I, I, I'm kind of neutral on the name, the giggle, but I, that is the reaction that popped in my head first thing. Right. <laughs> Whereas my reaction was uh, about the giggle loop, which is from Coupling. Written by, written by Stephen Moffat. Stephen Moffat. I never watched that. Uh, uh, there you go. And Stephen Moffat's writing confirmed for the third one. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's rumored, so <laughs> you never know. I was just making that up, but okay. well, he, which is for, what a rumor is for the Shuri Gawa series, I should say. Yeah, but, it's yeah. uh, um, I, I'm a, I'm intrigued now because uh, you know this is just sort of just a teaser. I was wondering what they were building up to. Would it be a full blown trailer? We kind of had one ish, like a, you know, a minute long one. This is very much a teaser where they're just like the the point is to announce the titles of the episodes, which is amazing. When you think about it, think, wow, we have a trailer to announce titles of an episode where is it past years are just like, here, here it is. There's like somebody, somebody like screen capped their Apple notes page. Is like, here are the episode <laughs> titles of this upcoming season of Dr. Who. And now they've done a big thing about it at Eurovision. Did we see the star beast in animated form beforehand? I don't remember if we did. <sighs> no. I'm talking beep the meep. And beep the meep. Yeah. Um, well, or whatever the, they call him in the show. In the, in the comics, but I don't... No, no, I, I mean like in the I previous know, trailer, did animated. we see him? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh. Well, briefly, briefly oh. we did. Briefly yeah, we did. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, all right. Okay. In a different shot. So that's not then. new either. No, no, no. We we knew that Beep the Meat was coming back. Uh, oh, so. I know. I just meant the actual in motion, you know, finished Beep right. the Meat sort of thing. Yeah. Or I'm going to I'm going to bring up your your remark from earlier about uh, if you want to talk about it about Catherine Tate poking Beep the Meat in the eye. 
Oh, that was Steve. That was me. Yeah, I said that often. Like, why would you poke? Why would you poke beep in the eye? Poke in the nose or something like that. Like, ow, right in the eye. That's just... from also what I that, can tell, that, that shot is also very ET. Very ET. That's yeah. exactly I what I was going to say. That that's kind of what they're doing. Yeah. Anything, but yeah. yeah. But um, yeah. Anyway, we'll find out in uh, in about six months' time. Six months' time, November <laughs> comes out. Yeah, it's still six months out, isn't it? I know. Well, I'm more trailers in that. <clears throat> oh well, hopefully, hopefully at uh, San Diego Comic Con, uh, which they haven't announced anything that they're coming there yet. And Russell T Davies was saying, you know hopefully that's that's the hope and obviously which means that he it's out of his control and we're probably relying on on disney plus to um <laughs> but which more later in the business section of this podcast but uh hopefully they'll pony up the dough and doctor who will come to um to san diego comic-con which means i'll be going to san diego comic-con i'm waiting to b- book my flight basically on <clears throat> on the the promise that doctor who will actually be there in a in a in a sizable form so and maybe that's when we'll get our first proper cinema standard sort of trailer for the three specials maybe we'll even see footage from that s- second one or maybe not if they're holding back this long uh, of showing just even any clip from that second uh episode then why not just wait as long as possible for it we'll see but exciting times ahead for doctor who here in the 60th anniversary of the show in question um also uh oh, wow. what what's that chris what'd you find sorry i was just looking at the oh. um the link in the show notes for right. the next thing that we're going to talk about <laughs> and at the bottom to talk at the about, bottom yeah. uh, because it's the bbc media center Spoiler. there was a blurb about uh ratings for the eurovision grand final last night so for whatever it's worth on bbc one peak of 11 million average of 9.9 million share of 63 percent wow so 63%. That's, mass, that's a massive share. 63% wow. is only 11 million. What's what's that compared to the coronation viewing? Uh, Good question. I don't know. <laughs> Warren, you're just sent Chris down another rabbit hole. I know. You're just like this. Uh, what do you call We We didn't want to watch. We did, I, told, I said no stats, Warren. I don't uh, watch either of them on here. Uh, BBC says an average of 18.8 million tuned in to watch the coronation, coronation across 11 channels and services, including BBC One, Two, ITV, Sky oh, News, yeah. and so on. Right. BBC One, specifically, a peak of 13.4 million. So, I'm sorry, folks. This is unintentional. And an average of 11.9. So about two million what have more I done? than yeah. two million more than your Euro- Eurovision final got. Well, Eurovision won. fails to oust King Charles the Third is what the headline really should be. Yeah, because that's a shock. woke Eurovision. So yeah. work that in there somewhere. Uh, the the bottom of the page, of course, is the the page where they they. Uh, but this is the, the next season of Doctor Who is going to be amazing and uh, expensive for Doctor Who cosplayers. Uh, the first look <laughs> at Doctor Who's Jonathan Groff. So not in the episode with uh, Jinx Monsoon, by the by the looks of it, um, based on um, shooting reports. Um, uh, Jonathan Groff appeared next to Shudi Gatwa and uh, Millie Gibson in Regency attire. Uh, Groff looks wonderful in his little sort of blue velvet thing. Millie Gibson in, her, in a lovely Regency dress, but no, we're all talking about Shudi Gatwa. <laughs> Let's face it. That, that red, that red velvet is just oh uh, chef's God. kiss. I listen. Let my my main complaint with the historicals of the of the Jodie Whittaker era is that they very rarely. Dressed for the occasion, uh, only in uh, Haunting of Villa Diodati did the yeah. companions do, but but Doctor Who herself didn't. Uh, that is out the window. That is out the window. There is no well, set costume for the for the fifteenth Doctor Shudi Gatwa, and it's amazing. Yeah. I love it. This is just, actually the best news of the week. Frankly. Yeah, it really is. It's not it's not just the costumes. It's also the hair because I mean he's in a he's in a wig for this, then he's got the other wig for the sixties thing. Yep. He dresses the part. I love it. I love, you know, I, I, it made me think of like, you know what? They did this back in the Hartnell era. Like it, it uh, as much as Patrick Troughton wanted to dress up much, he actually didn't other than his first two or three episodes where he's literally playing, you know, playing dress up at like the Highlanders and stuff like that. Uh, but you know, when, when Hartnell, Hartnell wore the outfit in Reign of Terror and the Romans, cowboy and the hat. Crusades, the cowboy Defense. hat, you know, like he always sort of like tried to fit in a little bit and, uh, he's kind of been the only doctor to really do that. Uh, on a on a consistent consistent basis, I know Tom Baker did in Towns of Wang Chiang sort of wore the uh, Sherlock Holmes deerstalker and all that. Um, this is diving in. This is diving in and completely 
uh, you know, fitting in <laughs> with the surroundings. And I so, am such a fan of it. Such a fan. So, so you're saying he changed his jumper. He did change. Yeah. Right. What a, what a, <laughs> what a turn, uh, in approach to doctors fitting in there, changes jumper for Eccleston and completely changes the outfit. I don't know what the, the, the main outfit, if there is one is for shooting at was doctor. I know the yeah, first one we saw, yeah, but that's maybe. like yeah. the only time I've seen it. It's like, here's what he's wearing on day one of shooting. That's basically what that outfit is. Cause there's not even really a silhouette going on in regards to uh, the other stuff. Like there's been another one where he sort of has a leather coat. Uh, so, you know, he has a coat over a, an outfit, which I guess is the same as his launch yeah. outfit, but I not mean, at all really. They introduced it at his outfit, but then this is kind of put pay to that really. Yeah. So, and I'm all for it if he just wants to go. The main thing about this picture is it made me go, okay, this is probably less likely a musical episode, which makes me happy. Oh. <sighs> That was somewhat gratifying, I have to tell you. Yeah. So we, we lucked out there. We lucked out possibly. <laughs> well. Speaking of fans making up their own story and then getting mm -hmm. mad, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's there's other, other set report stuff that we're aware of that we're not going to talk about, right? No. You, I don't, don't, not aware of it. We don't talk about that here. We, we, don't, much. Yeah. we don't, we don't do set reports here, but, uh, apart from, apart from stuff that already came out, like the, uh, like the, the tenant dancing with Neil Patrick Harris, but that's it. Um, yeah. Yeah, there and they were they must be shooting somewhere in public because uh, later on in the week uh, the BBC posted more uh, more pics of Millicent Gibson um, uh, in in her outfit standing outside somewhere looking very regal. So uh, obviously they're shooting somewhere, which is why they why they unveiled these now. But also it's just great. It's just great to see what the costumes are. So I am such a fan, such a fan of this. Mm. So well, by the time by the time Galley rolls around next year, we're gonna have seen whatever else mm -hmm. obviously we won't have seen in the episodes but uh we'll have seen the uh you know whatever whatever media stuff and whatnot and yeah already it's a very expensive proposition if you want yeah. to cosplay all the all also, the all the outfits that we have seen let alone whatever else is to come mm -hmm. also um rtd1 era he was always very good at keeping the back half very secret and springing it on us and surprising us most of the time for good or ill mostly right. good um, and ill at the end. <laughs> so I, I'd be shocked if we don't get more of this, frankly, somewhere down the line. Yeah. I mean, I imagine, uh, at the end of the ho the holiday, the, the quote unquote festive special Christmas special on, uh, December, I bet you they'll, you know, given they have shot so much of, of Shooty Gatwa's first series, I bet you we'll probably see a oh, yeah. hefty trailer yeah. at the end of that. Uh, to we always did things. before. So yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> except in the Whitaker era when they actually hadn't actually shot. No, it. no. I mean yeah. in the RTD era and, yeah. but, but again, they also, usually it was just the first half and they snuck a bunch or they snuck bits and pieces in that looked like they were the first half yeah and and let's face it they were a little bit slapped actually back in the early rtt or they, <laughs> well, they didn't okay, quite yeah. know how to make trailers at that point i think what do we do to well, make a doctor who trailer i don't know as as we've talked about before the way the way bad wolf seems to like to operate is shooting stuff way in advance yeah yep. so they'll, they'll 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 have the footage for trailers it's a, a it's a question of what they do with it i suppose yeah, exactly. but they'll, yeah. they'll have it if they oh I, well god i mean who knows i mean i think uh i don't know i don't know when they're done shooting shooty got was first series but it must be kind of close because they're only shooting eight episodes and uh uh we're probably into block four or block five according to doctor who magazine's production diaries so like at some point they'll probably be done shooting that first season so all of that will be in the can by probably comic-con at this rate and uh certainly Could by be, christmas yeah. yeah you know who knows well, if, it, if it is in the can by comic-con then that might increase their mm -hmm. the chances of them having a, a delegation oh i wonder if i wonder how much they'll put out i wonder you know hypothetically at comic-con like would they you know this is disney plus want to launch it they don't want to like obviously they don't want to look overlook the tenant specials um, for the 60th anniversary, but they also will most likely have Shooty Gatwa there as well, because, you know, he's going to be the face of the franchise after that, um, those three episodes. So they're going to have both of them there. Are, what are they, you know, it, it would be f somewhat foolish to say, here's one trailer and then here's another trailer, because then one's going to probably, you know, overtake the other in, in terms of, uh, of traffic and everything. So do you have a combined no. trailer for here's the three specials, but also the festive special, I, maybe? I don't know. 
I'd, I'd have to think they'd focus on the tenant stuff just because that's that's what's on the horizon. Yeah, because it's but yeah, exactly. It's Shooty Gatwa will. I have to think he'll be there. I have to think that both Tenant and Gatwa would be there if they do a Comic Con thing. Because well, I certainly hope so for your sake. Yeah, well, for my sake too. But just you know, this is Disney Sir is launching it. But you know, after let's face it, one weekend of David Tennant, it's now Shooty Gatwa's show. So you don't want to yeah. say here's a doctor, but only for a little bit. And when you're launching it for the first time on your service. I think you kind of have to have both doctors there. Anyway, this is us hypothesizing about what what Disney yeah, Plus might do nothing. if they go to San Diego Comic Con. So it just sort of makes sense to have them both there, especially with Bar the Barbie movie having been released. I think that weekend, so, yeah, maybe that weekend, point, maybe point. yeah, you know. So yeah, I think there's which be could a big keep push. Gatwa from. I don't know if it's released that weekend. They probably won't be doing publicity by that point. They'd be done. Uh, I can't remember the I can't remember the release date of uh, of the Barbie movie. If it's that weekend 20, or the twenty first, that is that I, I weekend. just mean all the press tour stuff would have happened a few weeks prior, right? Uh, so. yeah, or that leading that up to that. But I mean, a talk shows <laughs> writers strike per, uh, permitting yeah, uh, are in L A. So he'd already be in L A. doing press for that anyway. So. There he is being in, I mean, I don't know how big, how substantial Shooty Gatwa's role is in the Barbie movie. Uh, Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling might be the the lead stars on this one, but uh, but still he might be doing that for that and say, hey, since I'm here in Southern California, sure, let's uh, let's do up some Doctor Who stuff as well, seeing that he is the face of the franchise. So it makes sense. So here's hoping that I can very comfortably book a overpriced flight to San Diego uh, for mid to late July. For an overpriced there. hotel. <laughs> yeah, and to then cover you, this. And then you can watch the Barbie movie in San Diego. I don't know if I'll have time to do that, should the time comes, but uh, it's going to be an exciting time. <laughs> I just, I'm just... I'm just imagining you in the theater pointing uh -huh. at Shudi Gatwa and nothing else the whole time. <laughs> there is. That's it. That's Doctor Who. <laughs> That's Doctor Who right there. Everyone, stop looking at Barbie. That's Doctor Who up there. Yeah, I, I really hope Sir, it comes. Can you leave, please? I hope it comes together because, uh, yeah, the, I think it would be quite exciting for for the, for the podcast to cover uh, to cover Comic Con for the first time. Um, so I'm hoping it all happens and. And when it does, and if it's announced and everything else, uh, I'm sure we'll put some plans in for like, uh, you know, multiple episodes from down there and stuff, and maybe try to get interviews. And there's a whole bunch of other people who go down there that, that, uh, that we know that'll be there as well. So yeah, it, it'll hopefully be a big, a big event. It won't just be a sort of a one episode sum up like we've kind of done in the past because we weren't there. It'll be a, probably a bigger thing when, uh, when the time comes. So here's hoping that there, there's your, there's your, uh, your impetus now, Disney Plus. Radio Free Scar will be represented at San Diego Comic Con. So, <laughs> boy, I'm sure they're on that. Make it happen. Yeah, that'll that'll change their minds. That'll tip the balance. I mean, I'm sure they got other. Bob stuff Iger personally is going to phone you. Yes, yeah, phone you. Yeah, <laughs> tell uh, him how much he loves uh, loves the show. He's a listener, don't you know? Oh, he is actually. Yeah. Um, which means he'll be very unhappy about this. Uh, Bart Variety reports that uh, that Disney Plus has shedded four million subscribers in the second straight quarterly drop. Uh, but there, but it's so, but read this with, um, with a grain of salt because a lot of the, the, the subscriber drop to Disney plus pertains to IPL cricket in India because Disney Hotstar uh, didn't have the rights for it. They, they relinquished the rights to IPL cricket this season and, um, and thus, a lot of people in India canceled Disney Plus Hotstar uh, because that's where they only got it to watch cricket. So, yeah, cricket, cricket, folks, that game but, you you don't understand. But, uh, but I'm confused. Is, Isn't it because all the characters in Star Wars are woke now? That's it, actually, too. That, that, that must was, be it. That was mentioned. Yeah, the internet told me mentioned. so. It was, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the, the, the big news about this though, is that, uh, is because in order to sort of right the ship a little bit, uh, Disney plus is going all, uh, uh, Warner brothers media here by, by looking into, um, uh, some content curation and quote unquote, we'll be removing certain content from our streaming platforms. Uh, they expect the write down of this in quarter three to be, to save 1.5 to $1.8 billion. Which you know is exactly why well, writers if are it's going. It's a write down. That's not savings. That's them writing off that right, value. Writing it off by basically saying, "Here, we're there. We don't have it on there. We don't have to pay for it anymore." Um, you know. So well done, writer strike. This is exactly well, they've why they already spent it. They're just, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. You know what I mean? But anyway, uh, I, I I mentioned this just because you know at some point we're probably expecting Disney Plus to uh, to have 
the back catalog of Modern Who on there at some point. But um, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't look like they're wanting to add a whole bunch of content on there. But if that's part of the the, the, BB, the BBC Doctor Who deal, then, then maybe it... Uh, it would be there, but uh, I don't know. Still, it just still has no home in Canada. It's since January. There's been no place to watch. I, just, I was uh, at a gathering last night, and somebody said, oh, so where, where are we starting on Doctor Who? I said, oh, probably 11th hour and stuff. Except, of course, you can't watch it anywhere right now in Canada. Nope. There's no place to watch Modern Who at all. You know, let's you Way to go, it. Crave. Way to yeah. go, Bell. Way to go, Canadian television industry. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the deal is. I don't know why it's still, it's, it I, is still I on assume, HBO plus, right? In the States, I, we, we obviously, we don't have that, so we can't check, but, uh. I, I assume Bell slash Crave is only partly to blame. Yeah. They don't, uh. Oh, probably. I, I like to blame Canadian TV for a lot of things. Oh, as you should, as you very much should. Yeah. Like, oh God, did I mention this? Um, uh, Picard. So, um, the, the, for some reason, the, the versions of Picard that are on, on Crave in Canada, just another further thing. Remember, first off, they, they aired the, um, Doctor Who with the wrong aspect ratio and stuff. And then for the longest time, they had like the commercial, sh- uh, the shortened versions of like, um, some Matt Smith episodes on there. Anyway, uh, the, the Star Trek Picard ones, they, they removed all the commercial blacks in, um, which is dumb. But what they also did, because oftentimes when, you know, in the episodes, when they cut to the commercial black, uh, it's sometimes for its effect and the music sort of like, you know, reverberates for two or three seconds in black and then boom, next segment begins. Well, they thought in, in their magic wisdom, they thought, what if we <laughs> faded the audio down as the segment ended and then we wouldn't have to worry about that trailing audio. So you knew when a, when a commercial break was going to come up because this dramatic moment where the, where the music actually builds faded out to the end of the sequence and then boom it was awful and jarring and so i i found alternate means to watch the last two episodes of picard and with the whoa this is what we've been missing this whole time like it little it legitimately affected the viewing experience by doing that so yeah well done crave i'm really glad you know what maybe no doctor who being available in canada is better than having it poorly presented in canada so in, in some ways i'm kind of I'm kind of happy it's not on Crave at all anymore. That has been my rant about Crave and the Canadian TV industry in general. Well, I canceled it a while back, probably about a year ago now, so, eh. Yeah. yeah. Crave, Crave has, like, a whole bunch of HBO stuff, and for some reason they're still, like... Uh, um, well, HBO doesn't, so there we go. Well, yeah, but uh, but they also have like this long-standing deal because Bell owns CTV Sci-Fi, which shares Star Trek, and so they still have a deal with Star Trek and all this, and so it's still like the home of Star Trek, even though Paramount Plus exists now, and you can watch back at, uh, seasons of of Discovery and Picard on there, but you can't watch the new scenes. It's all very dumb and stupid, anyway. Yep, that's that's Canadian TV in a nutshell. It's all very dumb and stupid. <laughs> very dumb and stupid. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, Doctor Who Chronicles, the uh, issue eight, the eighth version of Doctor Who Chronicles, where it's uh, one of those little Doctor Who uh, magazine bookzines, uh, which uh, focuses on one specific year or era. The next one coming up on June 8th is 1963 to 64, that first year of Doctor Who. Very exciting times for the BBC. So that's uh, available for pre-order, not part of your regular Doctor Who magazine subscription, but uh, separate to it. So there, you can get it. Links in the show notes. Well done. Uh, I know that you two have been chomping at the bit to uh, to make your own TARDIS out of a milk carton. Um, uh, well, now you can. Uh, be- thanks to Blue Peter. Blue Peter has posted instructions and ingredients to make your own book nook TARDIS. What's a book? That's thing you put in your little, on your bookshelf if you have books. If you're, if you're one of those people who yes. has books, right? Is that how it works? Um, yeah, basically. Or yeah. do you put books inside the TARDIS? Right. I don't know. I, don't I know haven't either. watched a little video. No, we don't have to. There's, there's, there's. Steven's things. allergic to books, so yeah. I am, but well, I mean, I, I think you just put it next to your books and stuff like that. But you can build your own TARDIS out of like, out of like using a, a milk carton and some cardboard and masking tape or sticky tape and scissors and a craft mirror. You can get that maybe if you wanted some double sided tape. All the, all the supplies are listed there for you to uh to make your own TARDIS book nook or you could just have the character options one that I have. Is it, yeah, I was going to say is it dolly friendly cuz that's the key here. It kind of is. I mean it, it there's a there's a cute little ramshackle nature to uh to the to the TARDIS here which is kind of fun and stuff but uh, 
So if you're feeling crafty this uh, the spring or summer, or uh, this um, spring and... Kill some time before November. Yeah, okay. you can do it. Links in the show notes. RadioFreeScar.com. Um, Big Finish. Big Finish uh, is has launched a new thing called Doctor Who... F- the Big Finish Freebies. Well, they'll just like say, here, here, here's a back ca- catalog episode, which you can have for free. They're probably doing this leading up to uh, November, I think, uh, for the next few months is what they say. The first one they're dropping is the first Christopher Eccleston audio, the Rampagers. Which so. is good. Yeah. It's quite good. Yeah. That's the one That's the one I bought. So thanks a lot, Big Finish, for dropping one that I bought. A couple years ago. Come on. Yeah, I know. I know they did, but... I bought it too, and I'm not bitter about this at all. <laughs> no, no. It's a good way to um, introduce people to... To, uh, to some big finish stuff if they haven't heard it yet. Um, and if, hey, if you are looking for a writing opportunity, the the, uh, the annual Paul Sprague Memorial Short Trip Opportunity has started. Uh, so, so if you're an enterprising writer, you could you could submit your idea and they will, uh, the, the winner will be, um, they'll make it into a, a, a one-off little uh, audio adventure uh, that comes out around Christmas time. So, so there, all the rules, there's lots of rules that are in the... Uh, in this uh, are listed on the Big Finish website. So if you want to contribute, you can. So there you go. Um, other stuff. Magic the Gathering. You ever play Magic the Gathering? Nope. You ever For did? The same reason I ever played Warhammer because it's too expensive. Oh. I can see myself going down a very, very money intense rabbit hole and I was not about to do that. No. I never, I, I had never heard of it and, and, until Erica mentioned to me a couple of years ago. I think I didn't quite uh, understand what Magic the Gathering was. I'm not sure I still understand what Magic the Gathering is, but... Uh, it's basically the fighting in D&D in card form. It's basically, upset. I'm probably completely misrepresenting it, but that's what I gather from, right. it, from, from the magic of it. Well, there's there's Doctor Who themed Magic the Gathering coming now to celebrate 60 years of Doctor Who, and they're available for pre-order. They come out October 13th. There are uh, there are four ready to play commander decks and a collector booster box. I'm just reading this because I have no idea uh, what I'm talking about. I'm just reading it off thing because I've never played. I've never played Magic: <laughs> The Gathering, so the next item will be that too. <laughs> oh boy, is it ever! Yeah. Uh, so if you're if you're into that, if you're into that sort of thing, uh, it's like fifty bucks a pack US. Uh, you can pre-order them now, coming out in October. So, you know, Chris, you uh, you. Were you ever into Magic the Gathering at all? No. No? Okay. Well, if you are. Good luck to you. If you enjoy it, I'm not holding it back. I just never got into it myself. Nope. Not me. But that's awesome. That's awesome that Doctor Who is uh, spreading to all parts of the the universe and its breach and so forth. So... Uh, speaking of which, um, BBC joins web three says this, this he- a headline in the crypto times. I'm so sorry, folks. Uh, yeah. uh, the BBC has filed an NFT trademark for the doctor who logo. Now, um, th- this doesn't necessarily mean look out for all the doctor who NFTs. It could also mean people are trying to sell the, you know, you know, illegitimate copies of the doctor who logo in NFT form. Now we have a copyright for it. That could yeah. also be that. They also filed a trademark application for so many other things, like clothing and footwear and video games and VR software and hardware and sound and video recordings, like so much stuff. And and NFT was like one thing, like, mm-hmm. you know, soaps and shampoos and talcum powder was another applica- a trademark application. So like th- this is, you know, just one thing and a lot of stuff that the, the BBC filed a, uh, a trademark yeah, thing I'm, back on May 1st. I'm glad they're covering their butt on this because i just remember the height of web3 mania web3 come on um right when when jodorowsky's dune the movie that never got made it's a great documentary by the way mm-hmm. um but yeah. there's a book of it and these guys basically decided that since they bought the book they were going to get an nft of the book somehow and that meant they had the copyright clearly showing they had no idea how law or copyright or books work <laughs> so so if the bbc is protecting against morons of that type then absolutely but just why NFT? Come on, just let, let let the bored apes die, could you please? I, you know, I haven't heard much about. I haven't heard about a lot of it recently, thankfully. Although I have to say, when no. um, Jimmy Fallon was singled out during the writer's strike, because he's uh, he's not exactly like he says he's a union man. There's some there's some internal scuttlebutt about it. But I just saw a picture going around of him holding up this bored ape on television. And they're going, "This guy, do you trust this guy? Look at this guy." <laughs> 
Oh, and that shameful segment with, uh, what, Paris Hilton, was it? Paris um, Hilton. Oh. I mean, I don't hold it against her. It's exactly the kind of thing Paris Hilton would do. Fine, whatever. Knock yourself out. But, well, I think they were uh, both He's an idiot, being, too, so who cares? Yeah, but. they were both being paid, basically, to shill it on, their, on that segment and trying to be as enthusiastic uh, just, as possible just, and utterly failing this, because... This is why when I hear people yelling about AI, I'm like, we heard the same yelling about, mm. <laughs> about crypto and NFT and... Take your pick. So. Oh man! A Speaking of AI, uh, uh, the other day, uh, I don't know. We were like, "Oh, let's let's have fun with Chat GPT," and thinking, "Oh, you can, you can just like ask to write like a, a twenty. We're write a twenty five hundred word essay on something." And so they, okay, you know what? I'll do that. I asked it write a twenty five hundred essay about Doctor Who word essay about Doctor Who, and so it did. And it goes through all this, and it goes, and then at the very end there, before it reaches the twenty five hundred word limit, it says, uh, "And the current Doctor." is played by Ollie Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> I had it write a bio of me, and apparently I'm a highly in-demand speaker in the tech and video wow. game spaces. And and also, apparently I have an MFA. Uh, none of which is true. Right. <laughs> so. Well, oh, uh, so I went further on. I, I, I said, well, okay, let's see, let's see what happens. So it obviously doesn't know, <laughs> hasn't, isn't up on the latest news from like, oh, I don't know, a year ago uh, when Shudi Gatwa was announced as the new Doctor Who. So I said, write a 2,500 word uh, essay on Shudi Gatwa. And so, boom, it starts typing it out in front of me and stuff. It goes like, blah, 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 blah. not a single mention of Doctor Who. So chat no, GTP is out of date and it's a racist. So boo to chat and GPT and AI. And it's stupid and dumb. Dumb. Ollie Alexander. So obviously it just, it just trolls like the Daily Mirror or something like that from like April of 2021. Anyway, what are you going to say, Chris? I don't know if it's chat GPT or something else, but I thought I read something about it having... Like it, it, it's only been fed info up to 2020 or some stuff. <laughs> That's fine. What, what could have possibly happened since 2020? Dear, dear chat GTP, write an essay about the COVID-19 global pandemic. Oh, well, <laughs> this seems to be a thing that's happening in Italy and China. Nowhere else. The end. Name famous traders from 2020 <laughs> to 2022. Take a wild guess. <laughs> yeah, but they got, oh, there doesn't seem to be a certain January 6th trader in there. Oh, yeah, fascinating. No, no surprise. Anyway, I don't know how we got onto that, but uh, AI, uh, <laughs> Web3, NFT, WTF. Yep, that's about right. On, uh, on to the last segment of the show, which is the time lash, where we look back at this week in Doctor Who history. Uh, we start on May 14th. May 14th, this is the official <laughs> world premiere of the Doctor Who TV movie, by the way. On Fox, mm -hmm. on the yep. Tuesday night movie on Fox in 1996, opposite Roseanne, where uh, where John Goodman's character had a heart attack, I think, and so a lot of people watched that instead of the Doctor Who TV movie, thus cursing it forever. I, you know, I'm thinking that, to myself that at the time in 1997... Doctor Who, not really in the favorable position it is now. I think people didn't know it was happening, probably. No, there was there was some hefty promotion. I mean, you know. Yeah, I don't... but compared to Roseanne, one of the biggest shows on TV at the time, with a big deal, very special episode. Yeah. You know. That's true. But hey, look at it this way. Where's Doctor Who now, and where's Roseanne now? Oh, well, yeah. yeah. Roseanne is insane, and uh, banished, I believe. Yeah. John Goodman seems to be an okay cat, though, so... Yeah, but you bet on the wrong horse there, Fox. I mean, they didn't bet on Roseanne either, but, uh, you know. Um, here's one that uh, that fascinates me. So May 14th, 1965. Recording. <laughs> I'm waiting for this. Recording yeah. for The Chase takes place at Riverside Studio One in Hammersmith. Uh, Peter Purvis playing Morton Dill makes a good impression on the cast and crew and is offered the role, the role of the new companion, Michael Taylor. What I love about this, as I've said often on the show, they're recording episode three of The Chase. They don't have the name of the character or even the person who's playing him set in stone for a companion they're about to unveil in three weeks' time. Mm -hmm. I love old TV. It is so fly See, by the seat of your pants that they don't know what I, they're doing. It's so great. I thought you just wanted to say this because you like saying Morton Dill. And I like hearing you say Morton Dill. You have a certain enthusiasm for the Morton name. Morton Dill. I just laughed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Peter Purvis. That's... Uh, anyway, I love it. That's my, that's my favorite thing about the chase. How slow... I mean, it's just emblematic about how slapdash the whole damn production is but um yeah didn't even cast him fascinating 
Anyway, anything else on uh, on the May the fourteenth you want to talk about? Uh, that you want to bring up? You want to mention for for discussion? Yeah, sure. What do you got there, Chris? Um, couple broadcast debuts. Two thousand five, we got Father's Day. Right. Oh wow. 2011, 2011, the Doctor's Wife. That's notable. That's two notable things. Paul Cornell and Neil Gaiman with their first uh, mm-hmm. contributions to televised Doctor Who. Yeah. First time I cried watching Doctor Who was Father's Day back in 2005. It wasn't that bad, was it? <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> I, thought we, I thought we liked it. Yeah. A lot of people cried for The Doctor's Wife, too. That's very sad. Very good episode, actually. When I think about it. At the end, I, yeah. hmm. Now you're middling on it, Warren? Doctor's no, wait, Wife? Doctor's... Uh, I'm mixing my uh, nonsense up here. I'm thinking of... I'm thinking, that's a Neil Gaiman one, right? I'm that's totally, Neil Gaiman Are you yeah. thinking Wedding yeah. River, River, River I, Song, I, or...? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I was mixing it two up. Um, I, I did get a bit weepy at the end. Uh, there's problems with that episode, but that ending is great, I have to say. It is. You know, this is the time we said hello, you know, I thought that was really nice. Mm-hmm. That was really rather sweet, and Saran Jones did a great job as, uh, as, as, <laughs> as Helena Bonham Carter as the TARDIS. I thought that was kind of... Uh, <laughs> And actually, I, I I actually quite like that episode. I just don't think it was worthy of the gushing Neil enthusiasm that was happening at the time. It got a lot, but it was a big thing, big thing having Neil Gaiman write for Doctor Who. You know, yeah. oh yeah. You know, we talked last week about you know Douglas Adams dying very prematurely, but imagine like the the hubbub if Douglas Adams had written an episode of Modern Who, it'd have been like equal into that. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's fair. Yeah. yeah, and it's not bad. Like it's a three and a half out of four. It's just not a five out of four, which yeah. everybody seemed to make it out to be. Mm-hmm. 5-4 being my favorite time signature. Um, moving on. Uh, May 15th. Happy birthday, Daryl Blake, director of The Stones of Blood. And only that. Uh, I like Daryl Blake because he chose to shoot the location scenes on OB video. Because he hated the way that it looked be, uh, going from film to uh, videotape in studio. So, he's a winner for me. You might think that OB video looks cheap. And you're right. But uh, I think it meshes really well with uh, with the studio scenes. So see, I like when they go from OB video to film, back, especially if it's in the same scene, just because it's such <laughs> clanky nonsense. That that's why I love this show. Oh man, they oh, it's it's amazing how often they do that in Bl- in the Blake Seven. <laughs> just like suddenly yeah. we're on oh, film yeah, yeah. for two yeah. or three shots, and then back to videotape. It's just like uh, it's great. You didn't think that we it's crap, which yeah. is why it's great. You didn't think we'd notice. <laughs> Veer Laura yeah, Probably people didn't. People uh, like watching it on a crappy TV, a lot of people probably didn't notice. Like I, I know when I started in TV, my drove my parents insane because I would go, Oh, they they dropped a frame, they're like, Shut up, stop right. talking, we don't care. <laughs> and they're right. Why should you? Right. As a normal viewer and not a weirdo like us, why would you care? That's true. It's amazing how like I was I remember watching uh uh, series one of Faulty Towers, and there's a bit on film there where they're, um, they're, um, Polly and the guy are like scoping out the confidence trickster and out getting money or something like that. And I remember, like, if you watch that, I don't know, maybe they cleaned it up for DVD and Blu ray, but like the original version, you could just like the edits in between each shot, each cut, co- each scene, which is like this big, huge chunk. Like the editing was just mm-hmm. awful in those days. So, like, you know, in many ways, I was just kind of glad that they went to videotape because it meant that editing was much cleaner. Anyway. My uh, John Cleese is uh, eh, not the best nowadays, but I still think an all-time comedy great is where he beats the living hell out of his car with a tree oh, branch God, ineffectively. Laughed. It's I actually laughed. absolutely brilliant. I laughed so much as a kid when I saw that. Much more into Faulty Towers than I was uh, Monty Python at the time. Uh, I can't make that claim. Yeah. Well. Uh, moving on to May fifteenth. Uh, well, we're already we're already there. Happy birthday, um, we are. Daryl Blake. Nin- nineteen ninety. We should talk about uh, death, death of, Pre- of uh, Peter Wimgwaid. Yeah, Peter, Peter uh, Wimgwaid. Yeah. Oh, uh, production assistant, director, and writer. Of course, uh, died of leukemia sadly at like the age of like forty eight. He was very young. Um, forty seven. Yeah. yeah. Forty seven. Yeah. Uh, he was great. He was really great. He's one of the unsung contributors to Doctor Who. I find both writing and directing. I thought he did great turns in both. Uh, mostly directing, let's face it. Earthshock is amazing because it's oh, directed yeah. so well Absolutely. by him. But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, him writing time flights a little less, um, a little less enjoyable. <laughs> well, how much of that is his fault? And it's uh, not J- John Nathan Turner saying include the Concord, but remember we have well, no money. I was going to say the the <laughs> fact the fact it's the last of the series and they have no money is. <laughs> Definitely yeah. an aspect. It's like the poor guys. It's like, okay. Oh, here. Here's what we need to do. You need to write out Turlo 
uh, the character outline of which circulated, by the way, on, on May 15th, 1981, but don't answer to her. You have to write out Turlo, write in Perry, write out Chameleon, write out the Master, and you have to set it in Lanzarote, because that's where we're shooting. Go. Good Get on him. You know, and I'm not and, talking yeah, to you have... because you bl you supposedly blacklisted me from your little uh, dinner that you took me out for for when the the return that Dalek story was canceled. So, yeah, he had a lot on his plate, and he managed what it pretty a dumb well. Dumb industry television is. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> and ultimately, he had to make room for Peter Wingard. Uh, yeah, that's also <laughs> that, true. That too. Who, a friend of mine who works in the industry has described in less than flattering terms. Let's yeah, put it that way. yeah. You know, good performance though. Good performance, I thought. As uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, there's a reason he kept getting hired for these things. Yeah, it's pretty good. And of course, he's perfect in uh, Flash Gordon. But uh, as Clytus, uh, anything I else? Forgot he was Clytus. He was Clytus. Yeah, Clytus on board. Um, anything else on uh, on May fifteenth? You wanna you wanna mention? But actually, I'll mention this. C.E. Weber, Bunny Weber, to his friends. <laughs> uh, completes another draft of the Doctor Who format guide. Remember, they met on March 26 and hammered out a lot of details. And now Bunny Weber has uh, has uh, put out another draft of the format guide in which the time machine is now described as resembling a police box. Ooh. There you go. Oh, Tardis, buddy, more you on, whimsical japist. Yeah, yeah. And more on the format guide on May 16th as well. Oh, well, let's get there right now because this is exciting. I know a new version of the Doctor Who format guide refines the program even further. The opening story is intended to be the Giants. That's not the one written by Louis Mark. So I think it was a Malcolm. Was that the Malcolm Hulk one? I'm not even clicking the link and I'm guessing it's Malcolm Hulk. No, oh, it was about a, capitalism. It was, and the the bunny, it was the Bunny Weber one. That's right. It was. Bunny Weber one. Wow. Yeah. Good old Bunny Weber. Never wrote, never wrote anything for Doctor Who, but he certainly was, was there, there in its early stages. Maybe he's the villain of the giggle. Huh. Is Beep the Meep the bunny in Bunny Weber, perhaps? Possibly. Yeah. Probably not. Could be, yeah. Uh, anything else on May 16th you want to, you want to mention, um, at all? Uh, Brian Hales. 1975 submits a storyline entitled The Eyes of Nemesis. Oh, God bless Prefiguring the Star Trek Nemesis film of several decades. <laughs> That's exactly, or indeed Silver Nemesis, yeah. Or that too, yeah. Yeah, uh, it submitted a storyline May 16th, 1975. It was inspired, inspired in part by the legend of the Wandering Jew. I don't know what that legend is. I don't either. I, I don't know if it, I want to dig. I, I don't know if I want to dig into it either. So yeah, let's just leave either. that. I'm not qualified. Let's put it that way. Let's just let's just be glad that that episode, like so many other Brian Hale submissions, ever made it to screen. I have one more. What's unless up? Chris wants to throw in anything. No, nope, go for it. What do you yeah. got, Warren? 2007. Russell G. Davies begins writing Voyage of the Dam. This is just my fan canon, but my fan canon is, I would like to work with Kylie Minogue. Let's concoct <laughs> something, anything, to make that happen. It's just like Russell T. Davies begins writing. All it is is like a text message sent to Edward Russell. Can you get Kylie Minogue on an episode? To her credit, she's quite good in it. Like, she's I'm not complaining is. about her being in it. So, yeah. I saw oh. Kylie Minogue. Isn't uh, her sister, like, hosting uh, some um, I Kissed a Boy? I only know that because they showed the trailer for it right before the Doctor Who trailer uh, yesterday, right before Eurovision. I think that's like, no that's like, uh, like uh, Liam Hemsworth. I didn't know that there was, like, a lesser Minogue out there to... Uh, there's, there's always a, a, a sibling of some sort to the more popular sibling. Right, yeah. Uh, look at look at the uh, the um, Baldwin hegemon. That's true. There's so many Baldwins out there. Alex Bald Alec Baldwin. Uh, you know, before he um, <laughs> was let off for manslaughter in that movie. Uh, for some <laughs> allegedly reason, allegedly didn't shoot somebody. Yeah, he did. I, uh, allegedly, uh, is in a, a Gordon Lightfoot documentary on CBC Gem. I watched. So I think, what is Alec Baldwin doing? Baldwin doing in this Gordon Lightfoot documentary? Oh, it's always it's always great to find like out of left field people who are huge fans of a thing you yeah. never thought they'd be huge fans of. Yeah, I guess Alec Baldwin. Uh, I can remember one of the guys from, I can't remember what it was, it was some nerdy thing, but uh, one of the guys from Anthrax just loved whatever this nerdy thing was, and it wasn't horror, it was something like, something out of nowhere that he just loved. Maybe it was Doctor Who, I don't remember. All right. Matt, we went from Voyage to the Damned to Alec Baldwin loving Gordon Lightfoot, folks. And Anthrax. It, and Anthrax, uh, the band, not the powdery substance. No. Uh, May 17th. <laughs> I said Russell D. Davies completes the first draft of Alien. I thought I was going to say Russell D. Davies completes writing uh, Voyage of the Damned um, one day later, uh, but he didn't. 
he wrote. He fin- first draft and probably ran with it. <laughs> yep. But no, 2004, he completed the first draft of Aliens of London, World War III, with the side note, I'll probably write out the farting later on, and he never did. <laughs> never Oops. did. I Remember that? Remember when, uh, when there was a whole bunch of, like, BBC Radio promotion of it and stuff, and they had, like, a clip of, like, the farting Slovene and stuff, and I'm going... Is there really going to be farting in Doctor Who? Yeah. That was, <laughs> was my good. first new series O, period. Yeah. Yeah, and it was like a month before it aired. I'm thinking, oh boy. Which is why I was glad that BBC, that Rose leaked, because it sort of like got me used to what the new Doctor Who was going to look like. So, and farting aliens. Um... Chris, this uh, this is an auspicious date because it's the debut broadcast in 2008 of the Unicorn and the Wasp after a one week <laughs> break for Euro- Eurovision, and uh, mm-hmm. you were upset by this at the time, as I recall. Pro- yeah, probably. Yeah, you were. We talked about that last week. This Fifteen years ago now, though. Fifteen wow. years ago, the darkest three weeks of Doctor Who in its history. Doctor's daughter, no episode because of Eurovision. The unicorn and the wasp. Chris, Come, you're you're not mad about something 15 years ago? Still, are you truly a nerd? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, you, I don't you know. have to hand you your card, man. You got to hold it. You got to hold it a grudge, man. You can't you can't change your opinion for crying out loud. That's awful. I, I, I stole this like Forest of the Dead. If that <laughs> I mean, helps. I mean, I'm still a Sylvester McCoy era hater. So, although I'm more of a ignorer <laughs> at this point, I'm uh, I'm almost at the end of the Sylvester McCoy era. Uh, which is sad. I, ju- I just finished Bla- uh, Battlefield last night, and um, it's uh, I'm kind of sad. <laughs> I'm kind of sad that I'm approaching the end of um, of, uh, of of Doctor Who, of classic Doctor Who in my in my latest edition of the um, uh, the, the pilgrimage and stuff. So yeah, I kind of liked it. I kind of liked it. Are so. you uh, watching the episodic broadcast version for Fenric? I, oh yeah, 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 yeah! I'm watching. I'm watching Speaking that. Of true fans. Yeah, I. You know what? Uh, and maybe they'll rectify this when they put the whenever they put the season twenty box set out. I hope they include the four part version of the five doctors just for for you know laughs because uh, uh, I I just think that would be kind of amusing to me. Um, even though they didn't do it for what you call it. Um, uh, the Colin Baker, the season 22 stuff, but uh, I still think it would be kind of fun. You know what I mean? Because, you know, I, I need to know the cliffhanger of, of you know, the master coming down the stairs or, or Sarah Jane Smith rolling down a slight incline. I think it would be kind of fun, but I didn't get to watch <laughs> that, so I just had to imagine it. What a difficult life you lead. It's terrible. It's terrible, Warren. You have no idea. You have no idea how, how tough life is for me, and I will continue to complain about it. Um, let's move on to May 18th, uh, debut broadcast of The Wheel in Space Part 4. I don't know, I'm just mentioning that because of The Wheel in Space. Um, John Pertwee, 1971, is contracted for Season 9, the whole of Season 9. Good work, John Pertwee, for continuing the gig. That would be his third season of Doctor Who, which would tie him for the most at that point. Of course, he went on to do two more. Um... Uh, Mary Tam, May 18th, 1978, is contracted to play Romana in the final four serials. Of, so obviously she impressed during the Pirate Planet to uh, to uh, to warrant such a grand extension for the rest of the season. Way to way to hammer that home there, Graham Williams. Good Teenage negotiator. Warren thanks you, BBC Legal Department. Yeah, I love Mary Tam. Love Mary Tam. She was lovely as Romana. She was my first companion in a, when I first got into Doctor Who. Still, still holds up. Emotional attachment well, they to Doctor Who. They do, I know, but Mary yeah. Town was my first, you know. It's just, oh, that dastardly Lala Ward showing up at the beginning of Destiny. What are you doing? Change yes. back to Mary Town <laughs> right now. If you keep going <laughs> back in she? there. I know. Like go, or, you keep... or go to the tall lady with the green <laughs> makeup or whatever. <laughs> just like, it was such a tease as a, as a brand new viewer to Doctor Who. They go, what, what are you doing? You can't just change, you idiot. This is dumb. You just you changed to a whole bunch of people that weren't Mary Tam. Change back. Well, this is this is basically the why is why is this book about Day of the Dalek saying the Doctor has white hair? That's clearly wrong. <laughs> it's so strange. Harlan Ellison praised it. I, I don't know, understand. Right? What he must know something about that. He left his name on it. This, it says Harlan Ellison likes Doctor, not Cord Wayne or Bird. Damn it! <laughs> wow, we are going in seventeen different directions at once on that one. Very deep. 
Hmm. Um, anything else on uh, May 18th before I move on to the 19th, Tall? 2013. 20, 2013. What yeah. happened 2013? Name of the Doctor, I love it. I just want to sing its praises. I think it's fantastic. I think Matt Smith does incredibly good work in it. Like, just the way he goes from goofy as hell to deeply, deeply scared and, and like, mournful. It, mm-hmm. it, that takes a lot of work that it's he doesn't make it look like. I look forward to watching that one again because I have I don't have the the you know the intrinsic memory of that one as I do other episodes of the era and stuff. I remember them crying about Trenzalore and then they go someplace and then at the end there's John Hurt and then that's oh, it. No, it's, you like, know? Just just the beginning, all that classic stuff was fan freaking. Oh right, and that's that episode. Where he yeah, says, yeah. He says goodbye to River, which I think is just perfect. I think they do an amazing job of that. Like it's it's great Stephen Moffat writing where it balances funny and touching and sad all at the same time and clever. Yeah. Like it's just, uh, it's great. And then John Hurt shows up and you're like, what? For six yeah. months. I seem to recall, they didn't, uh, I mean, the, the the scuttlebutt was out there that John Hurt was the doctor or something. He was going to show up and, and I couldn't, I, I remember the, the reveal being, really? They're doing this? Like, I, I think that's what my initial impression was. I don't remember. This is like literally 10 years ago now, but uh, I seem to recall it was out there already. And so I wasn't surprised, and I was more like surprised that the rumor that I had uh, had heard, and I wasn't digging for him back then, uh, that it was actually true. I don't know what you remember. But even about still, that. Yeah. even up to the opening bit at Day at the Doctor, they're still playing with the idea: is he or isn't he? We don't really know. Yeah, that's right? true. Yeah. Introducing John Hurt as the Doctor. We only we had six more six more months to wait. It was too long Name for some more fans. iconic duo. I'll wait. Yeah. John Hurt and John Hurt yeah. and I Claudius. I have yet to watch uh, all of I Claudius, and I want to do that. I should too. Yeah, it's good. That should be on BritBox, damn it. Crying aloud. Yeah, why the hell isn't it? I, I don't know. Probably expensive. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. It might be on Acorn or something like that. I don't know. Lesser BritBox, as I call it. Um. May 19th, uh, 1984, the Oilers won their first Stanley Cup. Uh, that's what happened on May 19th. It ring, it sticks out of my head so much that uh, I think about it every time. Uh, so happy 39th anniversary to the Oilers' first Stanley Cup. For some reason, I was looking for that on the time lash. I don't know why. It's not on there. It's not on there at all. I know. Uh, the Green Death, though, broadcast May 19th, 1973, episode one, the beginning of the end for Joe Grant. Very well written out character on Doctor Who. Um. Uh, other other stuff that happened. Uh, boy, it's a it's a big day in the in the in the history of uh, of the Doctor Who TV movie. Uh, in 1994, under instructions from CBS president Howard Stringer, the network decides against being involved with Doctor Who. That must have been a, a bit a bit of a blow. But uh, what a network president name, Howard Stringer. Howard is. Stringer sounds like he's someone off someone from Network, like Howard Beale or something like that. Yeah, it totally like, does. Uh, but a year later, that exact day uh, in history, May 19th, 1995, Matthew Jacobs submits a storyline for the Doctor Who TV movie, which would, of course, initially become the actual movie in question. Um, anything else? Anything else on uh, yes. on May 19th? What do you got, Warren? 1975, Louis Marx, uh, Marx received staff clearance to write Planet of Evil only because that sentence makes me think of people in the Sunmaker's hallways, which are almost assuredly BBC hallways, with like those light, those flashlights that airplane guys have. Right. <laughs> Just going, moving. Louis Marx, coming through, Louis Marx. <laughs> <laughs> well, it popped in my head, but it did. Actual clearance. He has clearance. I repeat, he has clearance yes. for Planet of Evil. It's not, a, it's not a permission to write an episode. It's that he was escorted down a hallway exactly. to go write Driving it. Driving in that thing from the Sunmaker's. <laughs> That little car. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, in the States, it would be a police escort. But this is BBC staff clearance where we drive a little car that goes three miles an hour. Er, yeah, Louis Marks exactly. in the back. Here, I'm on my way to write a Doctor Who episode. Out of the way. That's exactly how it worked. Perfect. Um, How long have we got of these ones? I don't remember. We're on the May 20th. Let's do the last one. May 20th. Uh, happy, happy birthday, John Luke died many years ago. John Lucarotti was born on this day in 1926, wrote, uh, uh, several episodes that no longer exist, uh, like Marco Polo, Aztecs, Aztecs still is around, but the massacre is, is, uh, long gone for now until we dig it up in a basement somewhere from some film collector, um, whole bunch of stuff actually happened on May 20th. The, the current draft, another f- draft of the Doctor Who format guide, is submitted to Controller of Programs for BBC One, Donald Beverstock, who indicates good, good his name. approval. 
Yeah. By the way, that film collector, Alec Baldwin. Alec <laughs> Baldwin loves Gordon Lightfoot and 16 millimeter film copies of Doctor Who. But you just got to imagine him as as Jack uh, Donahue in 30 Rock lecturing <laughs> Liz Lemon on why he loves 16 millimeter <laughs> Doctor Who film print so much. I mean, has anybody ever asked him? Maybe he does like it, you know? He could. Who knows? Well. Um, Mervyn Pinfield died uh, May 20th, 1966. Uh, he was uh, the first associate producer on Doctor Who, directed some episodes as well. Did not, um, sort of invented the teleprompter, but didn't uh, patent it in time, according to the Doctor Who TV movie. But um, he was noted that for historical his, document. Yes, yeah. he was noted for his technical uh, innovations. But uh, so, so don't look, don't look too closely when. Sidney Newman meets with uh, Mervyn Pinfield in Adventure in Space and Time in like October of 1966 uh, to talk about um, them getting rid of William Hartnell because he was, Mervyn Pinfield was dead at the time, but it was a lot easier to just have Mervyn fin- Pinfield there as played yeah, by Jeff Rawl than writing in one person to, to say that you should fire William Hartnell. So, yeah. By the way, 1964, uh, more head cannon coming your way. Sidney Newman suggests that Doctor Who should be cancelled if satisfactory studio facilities cannot be found for the program. It is soon agreed that Riverside Studio One will be the show's new production home. I, in my head, Uh am saying, Sidney Newman said, hmm, let's see, Cuban Missile Crisis? Gonna try that. (laughs) (laughs) Art of Brinkmanship, what do you think of that, boys? Good good on him. Good on him for driving a hard bargain, you know? Because it was was in these very antiquated studios at Lime Grove that uh, that Doctor Who is being made. And uh, yeah, so he pushes hard and gets gets to the Riverside for the next year. Then it goes back to Lime Grove pretty much later on. But Antiquated in the 60s. That's pretty damn antiquated. Yeah. Yeah, it really was. Um, what else happened? Debut broadcast of The Evil of the Daleks, episode one, on May 20th, 1967. Uh, which featured the Beatles heard in the background in a in a in a place, and indeed, uh, not the music that you're listening to right now, but the music that was thought to be playing in the background in another scene in that same cafe. So happy anniversary to supposedly the time lash because the music we use is from the stock music album, and they chose the wrong track for it. It's actually something called Mexican Beat. There you go. There's your tie-in that I was not expecting to make here in the time lash. Today. That nobody asked for including no, us. Nobody asked for it all. Um, uh, death of Lenny Main. We did a miniscope on Lenny Main, the director of Doctor Who. He died in a boating accident on uh, May 20th, 1977. Uh, another uh, uh, correction that I have to make. Uh, it says the birth of John Pertwee. Of course, that's July 7th, 1919. John hmm. Pertwee died, sadly, May 20th, 1996. I remember being quite sad and very shocked because I saw it as a little insert in like the Calgary Sun because I was living in Calgary at the time going to school and uh, and saw that John Pertwee had died. And I thought, oh no, John Pertwee. It's very sad. To which yeah. everybody said, who? Well, it actually did say that. Who? Who died? Doctor Who. Well, I know, but I'm just saying, yeah, it, given Edmonton in the 90s, nobody knew who the hell that was. Yeah, I still, I still have a clipping somewhere. I, I clipped it out, uh, the obituary in the Calgary Sun. Um, back when I read the Sun, thank God. Um, we all change at the times, don't we? Um, and I still have it somewhere. I don't remember where it is. It's very graying, though, and everything. But yeah, John Rivera died. In the States, in Connecticut, two of the three uh, uh, doctors that have died... Uh, died in the U.S. <laughs> there you go. There's your mm. depressing fact. Thanks, America. Thanks for nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Killing 67% of our doctors who. Um, anything else? Hopefully not pertaining to death uh, you want to mention on May 20th before we wrap this well, sucker up? <clears throat> 1972, the Time Monster Episode 1. That's a form of death. <laughs> uh, also... Yeah. Just to wrap it up in a nice little bow. Sure. Uh, 2008, BBC announces Stephen Moff will be the new executive producer and showrunner. Uh, is, since he is one of the patron saints of this podcast, really, in a way. Or our favorite showrunner, anyway. I so think far. so. Yeah. Uh, and then he goes on to write Chris's uh, least favorite uh, Stephen Moffat episode, which is somewhat uh, mm-hmm. intriguing and stuff. But uh, yeah, I remember that. That was a big day. That was a big day that we had a, like the first handover of, uh, of showrunner of Doctor Who. And we probably worried about it, not yeah. doing much of anything. That was a Saturday, obviously, wasn't it? Uh, uh, May 20th, 2008? Or was it a Friday? I can't remember I now. Remember. Oh, yeah. I don't remember. I, know. I don't know, and I'm not looking it up. <laughs> no. Good call. Chris, Chris has gone lazy. Um, but that's... Uh, 20, 20, 2017, Stephen. Uh, 
debut broadcast of Extremists. Oh. One of your lesser lights. Yeah, I just do not like Extremists. Just does not sit with me very well at all. The pacing's off. Something's wrong with it. I just, uh, yeah. It's not, uh, it's not one of my favorite uh, Capaldi episodes. Or indeed Stephen Moffat episodes. Extremists. Just, I'm just not a monk guy. The monks are just kind of crappy Palpatines. Yeah. I don't know. It wasn't the monks that upset me. It was, uh... I don't know. Just, uh... It's not that they upset me. They just don't engage me in any way. Right. I just think the pacing was off. And that, I don't know. The, the direction of it just it was a bit sluggish. And it just, like... There were parts of it going, what is happening even here? This is dumb. <laughs> I didn't like it. So, we'll see what happens in a few weeks' time when I come to watch it during the pilgrimage. But, yeah. Didn't, uh, didn't sit well with me. So... Well, on uh, on that note, let's uh, let's wrap up the time lash, and indeed, this episode, this nine hundred and sixth numbered episode of Radio Free Scar, the Doctor Who podcast uh, from Canada that you have listened to for the past sixteen and a half years. You fools! Uh, <laughs> next week, uh, more stuff about Doctor Who, most likely. Uh, as we, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that Doctor Who hasn't been on air for like you know eight months, and we still have a full slate of topics to talk about that's how great the show is and uh, we'll have more stuff to talk about next week on this podcast so join us then won't you uh, until then I am Stephen in Edmonton we're in Vancouver and Chris in Edmonton so long for now you've been listening to Radio Free Scaro. Find us online at RadioFreeScaro.com. Follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Radio Free Scaro. Subscribe to us on iTunes and donate to the show at Patreon.com forward slash Radio Free Scaro. Thank you.